people are aiming to be allowed to speak here, because as I will, I will return to this point at the end, uh, it's extremely important what you are fighting for here. Today, we effectively live in an era where incredibly important, let's call them ideological struggles, are taking place. For example, although it's fashionable today to criticize President Obama, and I am very critical towards him, but don't underestimate the impact of that debate about universal health care. This was his great achievement to trigger a debate. You know why? Because that debate disturbed the very core of American ideology, this notion of freedom of choice and so on, you know, because this is how Republicans succeeded to totally dilute Obama's health care reform by claiming, ah, Obama wants to take from us the freedom of choice. It was the right debate. And it, this, for, we can other debates like this. It's a wonderful example of material weight of ideology. A girlfriend uh, of a friend of mine, of Udi Aloni, Sarah Cummins, started to circulate a letter against this, how do you call this, DSM. You know this, uh, is DSM, this psychiatric... Oh, DSM. Yeah. Sorry? DSM. DSM, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I uh, told her, okay, who cares about some categorization there? And she told me, are you crazy? The categorization there determines which illnesses will be covered by insurance organizations, which, which, uh, which, uh, which medicines, pills, or which treatments will be covered by it, In other words, we may, it may appear that we are just there fighting for some minor theoretical points, is hysteria uh, uh, illness or not. We are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Because, do you know that, speaking about military-industrial complex, but do you know that in the United States, the, let's call it, medical-industrial complex, spends twice the money more than the entire military-industrial complex. So, and uh, I will return to it at the end. This is why I think it's absolutely crucial, the fight that is going on here. In what sense? I will return to it to the end. Let me just, to, so that I don't forget another anecdotic fact. Uh, it's really madness what happened. Did you read it? I think this is part of the same reactionary offensive that Julian Assange will be extradited. I mean, I don't idealize him. I mean, but uh, he explained to me, and I checked it up, there is madness in this case. Where is madness? Do you know? that this is the madness. You know why they will extradite him for accusations of rape. Okay, but you know what forum this rape had. It was a totally consensual sex. Thus, two weeks afterwards, the woman complained something that he didn't use the right type of condom or something like that. And for this, he is extradited. Now comes the total point of madness. Do you know that there is no charge in Sweden against Assange. So he will be extradited without there being any charge against him. And you will like this. Do you know what law did they use? Most European countries accepted in around 1920, when everyone, they were afraid of the spread of Bolshevism, they accepted some kind of a law where if you are suspected of communist terror without even clear accusation, you can be extradited to another country and so on. This is one of these weird laws that exist only because they forgot to cancel them, to cancel them. It looks like I now read, you can check it on the web, this is a monument to legal order, I claim. Like the most crazy laws in the United States, like in Texas, if you have, be careful if you go to Texas, if you have more than six of sex toys, more than six, you can be arrested. Then in another country, Tennessee or where, uh, so, uh, uh, anal intercourse, you can be arrested. You know, these laws that nobody, nobody even 
thinks about them. No, this is what they are using there. No, so it, again, it's pretty dark because don't have any big illusions about Sweden. Assange told me, you know, Sweden is no longer the Sweden of our youth of uh, Olaf Palme and so on, which at least stood for certain standards. Okay, getting lost here, let me begin with, again, how proud I am to be here, as my friend Mladen Dolar explained to me uh, uh, what, like him, what I really like here is already the subtitle of this institution. It's blah, 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 for Art Design Theory. Of course, as a Hegelian, I immediately recognized in it the three forms of absolute spirit, you know. Art, art theory, philosophy, design is religion. Religion is theory, the problem of design. You have an idea of God, what design to make to make it palpable, no? And uh, so, uh, uh, before elaborating this a little bit, I hope you will not be disappointed. I will, uh, what you will get here is, you know that uh, proverb, English phrase, that what the bride should bring when there is a wedding. No, it's something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. You will get something like this from me here, but with a little bit of change. Something old, yes, as always, I will recycle myself. <laughs> something new, there will be some original idea. Uh, something borrowed, yes, especially from my Slovene friends, Mladen Dolar and Alenka Zupancic. And here there is a problem. Not something blue, you will get something red at the end, of course. <laughs> but then there must be a, a rhyme. So instead of new, I propose bad. Bad for the, those in power. So I will give you something old, something bad, something borrowed, something red. Why? <laughs> you know that here we are in Jan van Eyck. Academy. You know, of course, even I knew it without checking on Wikipedia, which is the most famous painting, no? that guy Arnolfini and his bride. And this is a nice metaphor for theory. We, the theory, of, are of course that mirror, that mirror where you see why. Because you know what, what you see in that mirror in the middle of the painting is like the production process, in a way, no? It's precisely, we have to reflect into the scene of ideology what is outside, the productive process. Uh, so, again, I will come back to this later. Just a short remark, then business <coughs> starts. Just a short remark on these three forms of absolute spirit, that is to say, art, design, religion, and uh, theory. You know, let's nonetheless, because serious high culture is obviously threatened today. I will return to this to the end. You know, the time has come to accept a tragic fact that we who are now under criticism, kind of a useless academic study, we are the last survivors of high culture. And the good point is that at the end it will be we, the leftists, who will be the last chance for high culture. Because what those in power want from us more and more is, uh, like, uh, is education whose aim is to produce experts. Like I was debating Bologna reform, this terrible European community thing in France, and a guy who later even wanted to become a minister gave me a wonderful example. He told me, this was a couple of years ago when there were burning cars in Paris suburbs. He told me, look, now cars are burning there. We don't need some stupid abstract philosophy. What we need from you intellectuals is, we need specialist psychologists to, to describe to us the psychology of the wild crowd, how to control it. We need urban uh, urban developers to know, you know, how to construct suburbia so that to prevent mass gatherings and so on and so on. That's what they want to, from us. They want us as experts to solve the problems that they formulate. But that's not theory. This is the end of theory. Theory is precisely, the first step of theory is not to answer 
problems formulated by others, but to formulate the problem correctly. This is where theory begins. Like today, for example, yes, we are all against racism, uh, sexism, and so on, but the problem is what? My old example, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, with racism and sexism. Did you notice typically how we automatically translate racism, sexism into problem of tolerance? But this is not self-evident. Think about uh, Martin Luther King. He practically never mentions tolerance. Why do we automatically translate racism, sexism into a problem of tolerance? Again, this is a sign of this post political, cultural capitalism where all conflicts are conflicts between different cultures and then all you can do is tolerate differences and so on and so on. For Martin Luther King, my God, racism wasn't a problem of tolerance, it's a problem of economic injustice, loss and so on and so on. Even for feminism, it, go, it goes the same. I found it even ridiculous, and every woman does who is a feminist, to claim that the goal of feminists is what? That women should be more tolerated by men or what? It's ridiculous. <laughs> this is not a problem. It's ideological mystification of a problem. Not to mention my other well-known, I repeat them too much, I know examples. For example, ecology. Yes, it is a problem. We may all die because of it, maybe. But uh, did you notice how what is more and more in front, presented to all of us, is precisely the ideological version of what I like to call, uh, what some people already call, the way of life eco ecology. You know, like, they offer you as a bright, small daily rituals to keep you ecologically satisfied. Like, did you recycle that Coke can? Did you put, did you separate newspapers to be recycled? And Okay, it's good to do this, but the problem is that when you do this, you already feel some. You see, I'm doing something for Mother Earth, a great project and so on. And of course, in this way, it makes you feel good. The real, le the real problem somehow disappears. So again, this is our task as theorists. So again, uh, let me... Uh, just before I begin properly, this is just the, what in sex they call foreplay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just quote you a wonderful couple of lines from Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's, uh, it's Act 5, first scene, where Theseus says, listen, it's beautiful, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, does glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy what a beautiful formulation. And the poet gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. <coughs> so, Shakespeare articulates here a triad. A madman sees devils everywhere. For example, he misperceives a bush as a wild animal, a bear. A lover sees sublime beauty in an ordinary face. A poet gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and the name. So in all three cases, we have a gap between ordinary reality and some transcendent ethereal dimension. But this gap is gradually reduced. The madman simply misperceives a real object as something else. I see a bush, I think it's a wild animal. It's simple confusion. A lover maintains the reality of the beloved object which is not cancelled, but transubstantiated into the appearance of a sublime dimension. Everybody knows this. In true love, when you are truly in love, you do not need to idealize the object of love. You can be well aware of uh, all, all imperfections and so on. But at the same time, 
This is the paradox of love. This very imperfect, frail being is the absolute for you. Uh, then, uh, with the poet, it's something much more mysterious. We also get an appearance. But this appearance, again, is neither, as with madmen, the appearance of some false reality misperceived as real reality. It's not that you see a bush, you misperceive it as a bear. It's not the appearance of transcendence in immanence. It's not this ordinary woman I see absolute, the absolute in her. It's much, something much more beautiful, a materialization of nothing. You are able to give shape and form to nothing. You have an appearance in which it's an appearance where it's not some substantial X that appears. It's nothing. Nothing appears. And maybe this is a nice formula even for <coughs> political revolution. This is what we need today, the political imagination. To give shape to nothing, opening of the new. And at the end I will return to it, another political point here. Do you know that, it's not a joke, I checked it up with my Chinese friends. Do you know that a couple of months ago in China, they, they imposed a new law which prohibits in all narrative media, comics, books, cinema, TV, in all fiction, narrative, all stories which deal either with time travel or with alternate reality. Of course, it's clear why. The idea is it's too dangerous even to allow people to dream about possible different societies. But I think this is a good sign for China, because it means at least that people there are still able to imagine the difference. The problem with us in the so-called developed West is that we don't need this prohibition, because our, and this is the material weight of ideology. Our, let's call it political imagination, is so constrained that or it doesn't work in this sense, like as my friend Fred Jameson put it decades ago. It's easy to imagine the end of the world all the time, all these boring movies, you know, asteroid hitting Earth, whatever. But it's impossible to imagine a slight change in capitalism. You know, it is as if all life on Earth can be annihilated, but somehow capitalism will go on or whatever. No? <laughs> so, so, again, uh, so again, my point was that if, if uh, this is religion, if uh, not, uh, religion is love, you are able to see in an ordinary face the divine dimension. Poetry is nothing, you see nothing as something, and Maybe we theorists, we are madmen, no? But, oh, definitely. Sorry? Definitely. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now comes a little bit more serious work to substantiate this all. Let me begin with an idea which I already used in my, uh, some of my work which I really like. It will strike you as eccentric, but then you will see how we practice it. But we shouldn't. I'm referring, of course, to my favorite theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who, in his classical novel, The Man Who Was Thursday, ironically proposed to install a special corps of policemen, policemen who are also philosophers. Here is the wonderful quote. The work of the philosophical policeman is at once bolder and more subtle than that of the ordinary detective. The ordinary detective goes to tea houses to arrest Thieves. We, philosophers, policemen, we go to artistic tea parties to detect pessimists. The ordinary detective <laughs> discovers from a diary that a crime has been committed. We discover from a book of sonnets that a crime will be committed. And so on and so on. Now you think this is madness. Ah, would thinkers as different as Karl Popper, Theodor Adorno and Emmanuel Levinas, would they also not su subscribe to just a slightly different version of this idea, where, for example, the actual political crime is called 
totalitarianism and the philosophical crime is condensed in the notion of totality. The thesis of, for example, Karl Popper is that philosophical totality, pretension to absolute knowledge, is at the beginning of the road which ends up in political uh, totalitarianism. Uh, so, to paraphrase uh, uh, Chesterton, the task of Popperian or Adornian or Levinasian uh, philosophical police is to discover from a book of Plato's dialogues or a treatise on social contract by Rousseau that a political crime, gulag, whatever, will be committed. Or, as we used to say when I was young, from Plato to Nato. You know, a straight line. <laughs> the ordinary political policeman goes to secret organizations to arrest revolutionaries. The philosophical policeman goes to philosophical symposia to detect proponents of totality. Uh, is this accusation correct or not? The interesting thing to note is how some apparent left-wingers, but also right-wingers, of course, liberals, but also others, even if they would find this idea of Chesterton, the way it's formulated, ridiculous, do practice this line. The great sport of today's liberal anti-radical thought is to detect in metaphysics of presence, in the, what is for them bad philosophy, the roots of future totalitarianism. What should be our answer to this? Our answer should be, I claim, uh, very simple. Our answer should be that, no, this is not what we theorists should be doing. We are not doing this. What we are doing is that through concrete analysis, we are demonstrating, we are trying to show how, how the system already immanently undermines itself. We are, to put it in Hegelian terms, and this is the content of the notion of totality, the true content. Totality, Hegelian totality, is not this ridiculous idea, things may appear contradictory to you, but if you put them in a perspective of totality, even apparently dissonant details serve the global harmony and so on. No. Hegel is here a radical thinker, and I think the most important critical tool is his notion of totality. Totality means precisely that if you are dealing with an idea and you discover some features, elements, which seem to violate this idea, it means that these violations, distortions of the idea are an immanent part of the idea. For example, you have marriage and you have prostitution, cheating, blah, blah. The point is not to say prostitution, cheating, violates the idea of marriage. The point is to show how in concrete social reality marriage is necessarily supplemented by prostitution or, as Marx put it in his classical lines in Communist Manifesto, marriage ultimately is a form of uh, uh, prostitution. You know, this, I, you got the Hegelian point, which is the distortion of an idea should be conceived as immanent part of the idea. Now I will be critical towards the 20th century left. I agree with those even liberal critics, why not, who claimed apropos of Stalinism, how it's too easy to say, oh, Stalin distorted Marx's original message, which was democratic, or something even more horrible, like I think that uh, today, when I had to sleep because of jet lag, there was a nice uh, intervention here where it was argued nicely against uh, this socialism with human face, whatever. No, the idea is that nonetheless, you cannot save Marx in this simple way. Oh, his idea was good, bad realization. How was it nonetheless possible that out of a movement inspired by Marx, the horror of Stalinism emerged. 
Okay, I say, but let's be honest in the same way about today's global capitalism. We should not concede its ideal form rel relatively till now, till now. Successful, acceptable, social democratic, welfare state, tolerant capitalism, and then in a Fukuyama way to claim, yeah, all other countries may still be dictatorial, brutal, but this is the goal. Slowly, slowly, we are all approaching this. No, the point is that all the symptoms, antagonisms, inconsistencies of global capitalism should be included into the notion of capitalism. Totality. Totality is not a harmonious whole. Totality is a whole. Totality plus all its distortions and so on. Okay, to be very concrete today, totality of capitalism is also Congo. Literally, you know Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, is usually painted as a kind of a Conradian heart of darkness. Yeah, in some sense it is, it's horror. The state doesn't function, you have local warlords, uh, you have about 100,000, at least I was told, children who were drugged when they were 5, 6, so that at 10, 11 you get perfect uh, killers and so on. But let's not forget how this same Congo is kept in this state by being fully included into the global capitalist market. You know that they have, I'm too stupid to know the names, some of the crucial metals for pieces and so on. I don't know. And diamonds, yeah, yeah. All that stuff is kind of, So, you know, uh, this is how precisely a place which appears as a heart of darkness outside is kept in that state, in that state by way of its total inclusion into, into a global capitalism. This is, this is what we should focus on. This is what, again, totality means. It's not this the most disgusting, maybe, justification metaphoric of religion, you know, when they say what appears to us as evil, it's only because we don't have the right perspective, you know. Usually people use this disgusting metaphor of a painting. Like, what appears to you as evil is the same as if you look at the picture, if you look from too close, you see just stains. But if you look at it from a proper distance, you see how what appear to you as stains as are part of the global harmony. Well, I find it a little bit problematic to say that Congo or Auschwitz were just these stains and we cannot see how they contribute to the divine beauty or whatever, no? Uh, if I claim that, uh, if anything, a materialist should maybe turn around the metaphor. That is to say that when you look closely at something, it may appear beautiful, no? But when you withdraw a little bit, you see how precisely this beauty is part of the global horror and shit or whatever, no? Okay, so uh, how is it that we are not able to do this type of analysis of totality? Uh, I would like to draw your attention to a certain technological invention which I love. Uh, it's not yet practiced, but I don't think that it doesn't function because, okay, as if this means something. I saw a report on it on, on I don't know what, TV. It's, I think, a perfect example of how an apparently innocent technological invention is not only penetrated by ideology, but even materializes at its purest an ideological mechanism. I'm talking about sixth sense. It's a so-called wearable gestural interface developed by an Indian, Pranav Mistri, who works at MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts, at MIT Media Lab. Uh, it's, it is a simple machine. The hardware is simple. A small web camera dangling here from your neck, a pocket projector, small projector, a mirror, all connected wirelessly to a smartphone in your pocket, and that's it. So what's the magic effect? It's incredible. The, if you have all this on, you 
begin by handling objects and making gestures. The camera recognizes objects, gestures, and identifies them using computer vision-based techniques. The software then processes the video stream data, reading it as a series of instructions, and retrieves, you know, a smartphone, you know, retrieves all the data, which are then <coughs> sent back, and through the small projector, you can see them on any flat surface in front of you. I was really shocked when I saw this report on TV, how it works. It's almost a miracle, in a way. It is like, for example, you are in a bookstore. You see, you hold a book like this, and of course the, uh, the camera recognizes the book, sends the data to smartphone, smartphone uh, 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 contacts the cloud, and immediately on the very pages of the book, you will see projected the latest criticism of the book, all the data, and so on and so on. Or, for, or uh, for example, you want to check time. You just do like this in front clock, and immediately time is projected, and so on and so on. Uh, or, for example, I just do like this. The camera recognizes this as a photo symbol, and instantly a photo of what you see is stored in front of you. Uh, uh, now, of course, I am an evil guy, you know, I'm coming from Balkan, ex Yugoslavia, rapes, mess, uh, ethnic cleansing. So my idea was, of course, I warn you, this is dirty, politically incorrect. Like, I hope this works, like, let's say you are a beautiful woman, no? I look at you and it's immediately projected onto you. She likes Kunilingus, Dostoevsky, that's the way to seduce her. Okay, I had to say, it. that's the next degree, you know. But what I'm saying is that uh, this invention was celebrated as the great breakthrough because it allegedly, and it does in a way, uh, overcomes the division between virtual world of information and like real reality. The idea is that the standard use of cyberspace still implies a radical division. Either you deal with real people or you are in front of a screen. The idea is that here we get the two dimensions together. You move in a real world, dealing with real people, but at the same time you are in, in the virtual world where data are projected. But here I claim ideology enters, because if we generally call the ground of ideology, what Jacques Lacan calls the big other, which here means simply the inconsistent network texture of ideological prejudices and so on. You should always ask yourself when your smartphone connects with the cloud, but what is in the cloud? Who controls the cloud? So, again, my po the danger of this technology, I think, is that it, in a way, naturalizes ideology. Because although you rationally know that there are two different things, like I am referring to the beautiful woman on my, <laughs> on my head, that one is your body, the other is the data, but in my immediate experience, you know, it's this magic effect as if the thing itself is answering back to me. It's as if out of you the answers emerge. In other words, we are back into the pre-modern universe where meaning is experienced as directly immanent to things. It's no longer this modern distinction between meaningless grey infinite universe and our human horizon of meaning. We are back at pre-modern unity. Ah, this will be your beauty drink, or what? Of so course. Remains. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so the second thing, even more tragic, is that precisely let me imagine my tasteless example. Let me return to it. Woman, he tells it there. And let's apply this to racism. Isn't exactly, I hope you will get the structural homology. 
Isn't this exactly how ideology works? Let's say, believe me, I'm not. I have many sins, but maybe, just maybe, I'm not a racist. Or to be more precise, I am a racist, but a universal racist. Like, I hate all races. <laughs> okay, uh, let's say that I am anti-Arab, and I see an Arab. But if I am a racist, what I see there, isn't it exactly the same? I see, you know, when a racist sees an Arab or a Jew, you say, look, his evil smile, look, he will steal you. It's literally, you see all the prejudices projected onto it. It's the basic ideological logic of perception. And again, the, the danger of this machinery is that, in a way, with all this New Age mythology, you know, uh, we are back into the unity of sensual domain of objects and the virtual world of universe, it stages a total mystification. Because it conflates two dimensions. Here, I think, we should return to one of the greatest philosophers, a total bad man whom I like, Nicolas Malabranche. You know, the follower of Descartes, I think was a genius, if there ever was one. Ah, no, he was a genius. He was what I called over-orthodox theologist, you know. He drew all the consequences in such an absurd way that you see the nonsense of it. For example, we think that we would all be lost without Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ came and redeemed some of us. No, my bronze says, without Christ, we would all be redeemed. God, in his vanity, wanted to be admired by men to redeem some of us. So God pushed all of us into sin, so that then he could redeem some of us. Just so that we will... Okay, so what, you know what is the specificity of Malbranche? You will see the connection with this ideological mechanism. It's so-called occasionalism. You know what is this, no? He solves Descartes' problem. Descartes' problem is we have two substances, res cogitans, res extensa, how are they connected? Descartes' idea is totally stupid. No, it's that pineal gland or what? <laughs> it was the only one single gland that Descartes found here when he was doing uh, this, how do you call it, not vivisection, but... Uh, no, no, not surgery. You cut dead bodies, I hope so. It didn't, okay, and his idea was there may be our mind is sending signals to our body. Now, Malbranche knew, so this is nonsense, but wanted to remain a Cartesian dualist. So he provided a crazy solution that our thinking substance and our material substance are totally without contact, incompatible. So how is it nonetheless then that, let's say now, I think about Raising my hand, my brain gives, or my mind gives an order to my hand, I can do it. He claims God is observing us all the time, and God takes care of the coordination. When God <laughs> reads in my mind the idea, raise the hand, he triggers the material process. It's all coordinated through God. Uh, I claim that, uh, and yes, then... Uh, now comes uh, Malbranche's total madness. His idea is that uh, then he constructs a wonderful narrative of the origins of fall. That is to say, if this is the state of things, how is it nonetheless that in our immediate experience we don't see things like this? We think I immediately contact my hand or I immediately affected by objects. His idea is that it was, of course, we are in Christianity, the guilty one is Eve. Adam was a good occasionalist. He knew what he sees there, material objects are totally separated by ontology, ontological gap from his mind. His idea was that when Adam saw naked Eve, he was so fascinated that he thought, oh my God, here the object is directly addressing me. He forgot about divine intervention. And then comes the point of true madness. Then, while Branch goes on that uh, God, when he saw this 
regression into, that's what I like that. The, this is, I think, the, mo the funniest definition of the fall into sin. <laughs> fall into sin is fall from philosophy of occasionalism into British empiricism, when you think that <laughs> objects <laughs> affect you. So his idea is that this is how then Malbron explains erection. Malbron says to remind men, women don't count, men, to remind a man that there is no direct contact between his mind and his body, he will make one organ, penis, independent of his will. Like, you may not think it should get up, it will not get up, or when you will least want it, it will get up. This is the reminder that they are separated. No, no it's, but you know what? What I'm trying to tell you, where is the moment of truth here? When you hear this type of nonsensical stories, you should always ask yourself, is there a moment of truth in that? You know, it's the same as with that Mladen Dolar, my friend, wrote about it nicely, that totally crazy theory of, uh, of, uh, of uh, how to unite Darwinism and uh, Christianity. You know that theory, no? I mean, when Darwin elaborated his evolutionary theory, Christians have a problem, because if you read the Bible literally, and you count all the generations, then God should have created the world a little bit over 4,000 years ago, no? Even some British guy had this wonderful idea that at 9 in the morning, at minus 4,200 and something BC, at 9 in the morning, God created the world, and so on, no? So, uh, how to unite the two? This, this uh, theological friend of Darwin proposed a wonderful idea that, my God, the Bible is true, it cannot be wrong, so the universe really was created 4,200 and so on years ago. So, what's the trick? Ah, the trick is that to lure us to seduce us, God directly created fossils, you know. He created a kind of a false opening of the universe with mirrors. Now you will, oh, this is, maybe, it is, okay, evolutionary, scientifically nonsense. But isn't it the best theory of ideology that you can imagine? Doesn't ideology work precisely like that? That each epoch creates its own false past. Like, there was a wonderful book, I hope you know it, it's a collection of essays edited by Eric Hobsbawm, the, uh, not invented past, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know where he shows, for example, that you know all that Scottish bullshit. <laughs> this is all late 19th century, of course, no? Okay, uh, so you see, and it's the same for Malbron. Of course it's nonsense as a scientific theory or whatever. But isn't something, if you replace God with ideological space, isn't this precisely the way things function. That is to say that precisely we are never just we in direct contact with reality. The big other always coordinates our contact with reality. What we see in reality is never just reality. It's so that this camera of this six sense machinery is literally an ideo a camera of ideology. How do we detect this? Now, uh, I will borrow, maybe she was even here explaining it, uh, but I will give a more uh, political twist to it. Uh, I will borrow an idea, or rather two jokes, from the other member of my slovene Lacanian party, Troika, the cell, uh, Alenka Zupancic, who drew my attention and wrote a nice text on it, maybe you even know already the joke, she drew attention to a wonderful joke from Ernst Lubitsch Ninochka. I think it's the best introduction into Hegelian notion of negativity. If you have a stupid uncle, half senile, says, Hegel, I don't understand it. Well, tell him this, maybe they will. It's a joke where the hero enters a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. The waiter replies, sorry, but we have run out of cream. Can I bring you, but we have milk. Can I bring you coffee without milk? <laughs> now, this is a nice Hegelian point that uh, 
like negativity matters. Think is not just what it is positively. You know, coffee without milk is not the same as coffee without cream. Even if in its immediate positive existence, it may appear the same. Okay, I don't have time here to go into the entire dialectics of desire here. Because, you know, the basic question to explain is why do we add to coffee milk or cream? There's only one speculative answer, because coffee is never fully coffee. It has an opening, a gap, and we have to fill in this gap. And this brings us to the most elementary structure of a commodity, you know, which is for me best exemplified by, sorry to repeat an old joke, but you know, kinder egg surprise that bullshit. This is a commodity at its purest. You have a chocolate shell, but you know how the publicity for commodity goes. Like, oh, you don't just buy chocolate, there is some mystical ingredient, ingredient that's it. Well, the genius of Kinder Surprise is that you really get that mystical ingredient, you know, that plastic stupid toy in the middle, no? No wonder in the United States, in California at least, you know that till a couple of years ago, I'm not kidding, it was prohibited to sell Kinder Egg Surprise. They claim that it was cheating, like you pretend to sell something, but you are really selling something else. Here you can see how Americans wanted to prohibit what in Lacanian theory we call object, objectita, object smolle, because this, okay, now let's complicate things, but you will say, but I'm a fanatic, I just like plain coffee. Doesn't this undermine your, I don't need any milk or whatever. Ah, I can claim the reflexive structure is still here, it's just tautological. Coffee can be its own supplement. Now, let me give you a, an example of the same logic from a history of cinema, which I like very much. If you know today's half-forgotten genre, nonetheless, Western, you may know that in early 50s, late 40s, there was a crisis of Western as a genre. So the first reaction was to shoot so-called meta-Westerns. Westerns which combine Western genre with another genre. You have like seven brides for seven... Who are the other guys? Grooms. Grooms, yes. It was Western with musical. You have a very good one even, pursued by Raoul Welsh with uh, Robert Mitchum, clear case of Western noir. You can even Western detect... You know, like Western is not strong enough to sustain itself, so you... Like, this would be, you know, Western with coffee is musical, Western with milk is noir. But then, André Bazin, the great French theorist, asked a wonderful question. What are then the two pure Westerns from early or mid-50s, kind of a legendary, although I don't like them too much, it's a Shane and High Noon. He claims these are meta-Westerns, but... The supplement is Western itself. They mythically, tautologically, which is why they are such pure mythical Westerns. Okay, la nonetheless, so let's go back. So, uh, uh, why is this structure important? This structure of, is it coffee without milk or coffee without, uh, without cream? Okay, to make this clear, let me connect this to another joke that I really like. It's from a, did you see, it's really 10 years, most of you are maybe too young, an English working class, half comedy, half drama with, with Ewan McGregor before he became a Jedi, when he was still working class hero, brushed off. It is kind of uh, unemployed minors melodrama, where uh, it's a wonderful scene in the middle of the film where Ewan McGregor, the hero of the film, accompanies a young pretty woman to her flat, and then... At the entrance to the flat, she tells him, would you like to come in up to my place for a coffee? He answers, yeah, but there is a problem. I don't drink coffee. Her answer, no problem. I don't have any coffee. <laughs> you see, the beauty is that without any obscenity, just through this double negation, I don't drink coffee, no problem. I don't have any. What you get is... The most obscene, brutal, erotic invitation that you can imagine. Just through double negation. Uh, okay, not to lose time. How
how does this work in ideology? Okay, to give you a very uh, first, it's clear the political example. For example, a Polish friend told me that in socialist Poland, where things were usually often lacking, they didn't keep them in the stores, there is a similar joke where a customer enters a store and asks, did you already get butter? Do you have butter now? And the salesperson answers, sorry, you entered the wrong store. We are the store which doesn't have toilet paper. The store across the street is the one which doesn't have butter. You know, like negativity matters. Now we'll say, what has this to do? Ah, now comes, sorry, I'm not just bullshitting, I hope so. Now a more important lesson comes here. I claim that today more and more ideology cheats in this way. At the level of implications, it acts as if it's offering you coffee without cream, but it's really offering you coffee without milk, no? That is to say, it cheats not at the level of what it says, but of what is absent in it, what it implies to say, but doesn't say. Uh, there is uh, uh, another stupid Marx Brothers joke, one of their bad late movies, Go West, at the beginning which exemplifies what I want to say. This scene at the very beginning of Go West, uh, Groucho Marx approaches, uh, what you call, there, where they are selling tickets at the train station, this framed window, and uh, buys a ticket and gives to the salesperson a bunch of dollars and says, oh, it's okay, you don't have to count the money, no? But the salesperson nonetheless counts the money in detail and says, but wait a minute, it's not enough money. And Groucho answers, but I told you not to, not to come <laughs> in. No. You see the trick. He, he, his implication was, don't count the money, everything is okay. No, but, but I think we can imagine absolutely something of the same. Do you remember Donald Rumsfeld? When he was justifying the uh, ir uh, uh, torture, Iraq invasion, he said, something has to be done discreetly. He meant pressure, torture for the interest of the United States, and we simply shouldn't talk about it, no? But then later, unfortunately, we discovered that he didn't mean only torture, which is also unacceptable for me. He also meant uh, organizing things for his private business, Halliburton, all the companies. And then, you know, imagine the exact replica of Marx Brothers jokes, that we would tell him, but wait a minute, you provided billions of dollars to your companies, and he would say, but I told you it's better not to talk about this thing and so on, no? Or if you want the same joke, imagine Americans and Europeans debating in late 2002 the invasion of Iraq to find weapons of mass destruction. Okay, Rumsfeld says to some European minister, would you care to join us in the attack on Iraq to find the weapons of mass destruction? We Europeans try to squeeze out, but we don't want to offend United States, so we give a kind of an answer, yeah, but we have no facilities to search for weapons of mass destruction. And then Rumsfeld answered, no problem, there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Like, let's just raid the country. No, but now, more seriously, I claim that, and this is a very dangerous moment, that's why we are having, and it's a good thing that we are having, all the demonstrations and so on. Of course, in our conference everyday life, we are opportunists. We don't want to know everything. An average voter, let's be frank, it's not that they don't want the state to torture. They just don't want to know about it, you know. Like, there are things we want done, but let others do it. And uh, again, more and more important is that this is why people are so disappointed today, that they feel cheated at the level of these implications, not at the level of what ideology says, but at the, at the level of what it doesn't say, and, but implies. And you will say now, who cares about this? I think this is absolutely crucial. An ideology never works just explicitly by what it says. It's absolutely crucial to include all the sometimes obscene, sometimes whatsoever uh, 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 implications. And there we have more and more the lie today. For example, did you see my last 
movie example, then a little bit of Marx. Did you see? It's an old classic, now it's emerging as a cult. It may appear naive, but I like it. I've written about it a lot. Did you see John Carpenter's film, They Live? You should. It's a crazy film, like kind of a primitive Hollywood Marxism, but in a good sense, not in the disgusting James Cameron sense. It's the story of John Nada, an unemployed worker in, uh, in uh, LA, who, Nada, very nice, Nada means nothing in Spanish, you know, like proletarian, who enters an abandoned church and then uh, finds there a box of strange sunglasses. And then later, walking around the downtown of Los Angeles, he discovers what these strange sunglasses do. They're kind of ideological critical sunglasses. Like, you see a poster, go to Hawaii, have the holiday of your lifetime, and so on. You put the glasses on, you see words like, enjoy, don't think, consume, remain stupid, or something. You know, in a very naive way, you get the true ideological message. Now you will say, but this is stupid, naive. No, it's not. I like this example. And I will tell you why. First, what I like is that it goes against our spontaneous ideological perception, which would have been, we see things distorted through glasses. You must put the glasses off, look with your own eyes, and you will see the truth. No, ideology is our nature, as it were, in class society. You need glasses. That is to say, you need, in a way, violence. Work on yourself to see the way things are. Second thing I like is how the scene staged by this film is already a consumerist scene. That is to say, it's not classical ideology, but today's ideology. Why? Because I claim that in classical ideology, the situation is exactly the opposite one. In classical ideology, you directly see the order. And it's all the dirty, obscene stuff that is unseen, but there. For example, in classical ideology, you would have a direct appeal. Let me be very evil now, uh, uh, taking into account all the pedophilia cases of Catholic Church. You would have a poster, become a monk, do your duty, humanity, live for Christ, and so on. And then you put the glasses on, and you would see, and you can have all the small boys you want, or whatever. You know, like, it would have worked like this. That, the obscene bribery of ideology is implicit. Here it's the opposite. The direct bribery is there, but the injunction, the order, is here. This is very important because this is how today ideology functions. It's more and more in our liberal hedonist societies that the order is still here, but implicit. And again, just imagine to see what is without milk or without cream, this is a very good, naive, critical approach. When you see some phenomenon, just imagine you putting the glasses on and what you would have seen. For example, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, my standard example. Imagine you see what we do, unfortunately, see often. I hate this manipulation, you know, a kind of a disfigured black boy's face, and then uh, for some charity organization from a call, like, oh, for a, the price of a couple of cups of cappuccino, you can make a difference, you can save this child's life. Now imagine you put the glasses on. I claim you would have seen something like, we know we exploit the third world, people are suffering there, but for the price of a couple of cappuccinos, we can not only redeem you of guilt, we can make, even make you feel good that you are doing something for it and so on. Because this is, I claim, the main function of charity today. Just to enable you, like, you know, you pay five dollars per month to some child in Africa and you feel good. I did my duty, fuck off, now I can live my life. Or, sorry if I repeat myself, Starbucks is even better here. Because there, the Starbucks is really, as I always repeat, a work of a genius. You know why? If you go to Starbucks coffee, you know what's the trick, no? They tell you immediately there, our cappuccino is more expensive, but we give 1% to some uh, Guatemalan children, 1% for water in Sahara, whatever. This is an ingenious operation, because in the old times of pure consumerism, we were consuming, 
and then we felt bad, so we had to do something to be also good citizens, no? But here, to be a good citizen, caring and so on, is literally part of the price, you know, like, you pay, the idea is, you feel bad as a consumerist, you pay a little bit more, and the anti-consumerist humanitarian charity is included into the price. This is what I call a genius. Okay, now a little bit of how did we end up in this situation. If you allow me, I am slowly approaching the end, don't be too afraid. Uh, I would like Andres to give, and I wonder, now I'm serious, if you would agree uh, politically with this reading. Uh, uh, where do we stand economically today? I am tempted to follow Fred Jameson, who doesn't know anything about economy, but is following some other economists who do know about economy, no? <laughs> that today we should reread capital by way of focusing on the category of unemployment. I quote Fred Jensen from his Representing Capital, unemployment is structurally inseparable from the dynamic of accumulation and expansion. Uh, so again, the more capitalism develops, the more it produces unemployment in the sense of workers who, when we have new technologies and so on, all of a sudden become unemployable. Uh, again, a quote from Jameson, the world market is thus a space in which everyone has once been a productive laborer and in which labor has everywhere began to price itself out of the system. End of quote. So, in the ongoing process of capitalist globalization, the category of the unemployed acquired a new quality beyond the classic Marxist notion of the reserve army of labor. One should consider, in terms of the category of unemployment, those massive populations around the world who have, as it were, dropped out of history, who have been deliberately excluded from the modernizing projects of the first world capitalism, who were written off as hopeless or terminal cases, so-called failed states, Congo, Somalia, victims of famine or ecological disasters, countries caught in pseudo-archaic ethnic hatreds, objects of philanthropy and non-governmental organizations, or often the same people, victims of the war on terror. So, the category of the unemployed should be encompassed to, should be expanded to encompass a wide span of population from the temporarily unemployed through no longer employable and permanently unemployed up to people living in slums and other types of ghettos where they can also be employed, but again, outside the system. And finally, the whole areas, populations, even states, excluded from the capitalist process. This is uh, the first point of Jameson. I deeply agree with it. So that again, Exploitation is not, uh, unemployment is not only, you know, so that, because I think if we don't take this into account, the way people are unemployed in this more radical sense, we should also redefine exploitation in this way, I think. Exploitation is not only today, like people in Congo are in this deeper sense also exploited because they are structurally put in a position where they are not even allowed to participate in the world of exploitation. I don't have time to develop here the more speculative logic of how to be exploited today is not only to be exploited in the sense of I work and capitalists take the profit. If you don't work, you are in a way even more radically exploited. And again, it's not the same thing as before. As we all know, more and more, we have categories of ex-employed people, for example, for 30 years working in a factory, new technology, and then, of course, some postmodern idiot like Anthony Giddens would tell you, oh, this is a new opportunity to reinvent yourself, whatever. Well, when you are 55 and tired, it's easy to say. But another thing, we even have, and this is, I think, the problem in Greece and other countries, 
We even have more and more people who are already, as it were, in advance unemployable. Like students finishing studies without even a chance of employment and so on. I really think that the category of unemployment is a crucial category and of course we have a solution here, with which I don't agree, a proposed solution, which was precisely invented by a guy, I think he's, he is, I will not name the country, bad of sin joke, it's a country immediately south from here, whose character is, people there have two features, that they have many pedophiles and good chocolate, which I think is one feature, because you would use chocolate to, to seduce small children. No, sorry, that, that. I don't, I warrant you I am a universal racist, no, no, seriously. Uh, what I want to say is that, uh, uh, Van Paris proposed the idea of basic income. It's interesting that in Brazil, where they passed it into a law, it's called renta basica, the basic rent. It's a paradoxical, crazy solution, because don't forget that Van Paris' idea is to save capitalism. His problem is, can capitalism retain all its productivity and nonetheless bring some kind of a social justice. He said, capitalism today is so productive that it can sustain also a minimal wage for all citizens. There are many problems for me here. The first big problem is that what then comes with the Marxist theory of exploitation? Now, you know, even the, un like, my point here being that the notion of exploitation should be rethought, but nonetheless it should be kept. Why? Now comes before the conclusion my final point, because I wonder if you would agree with it. But I claim that maybe it's time to, uh, to shift the accent on to exploitation from domination. The big, let's call it postmodern trick, Agamben, Foucault, and so on, was domination. Microphysics of power, different strategies of domination, and so on, and so on. I don't think that we should focus on the notion of domination. Domination still allows for some kind of a liberal or whatever option, you know, everyone should be included, <coughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. Because I still think that Marxist point of capitalism holds. The paradox of capitalism is that even when formally you have no domination, exploitation is still here. And I think that if we just focus on domination, then we mystify even the revolts, demonstrations going on today. For example, uh, how did the Western media perceive the Tahrir Square, the Egyptian demonstration? by changing them into pure pro-democracy demonstrations as if they just want what we in Europe already have. Precisely this, if you listen to them, was not the case. So again, this would be again the last point for me that uh, we have to rehabilitate uh, with all this talk, they are doing great things, all this analysis of microphysics of power, forms of domination, homo sacer, blah, 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 but a reference to production process and exploitation is needed. Now, to conclude, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, I claim that uh, if we really want to rethink our situation today, we should also kill many sacred cows. The left should really be radical, even against its own prejudices. The first one. You know, this problem, hierarchy. Let me now give you just three provocative ideas. One, I claim that the most dangerous idea, and here I radically disagree with John Rawls, is this idea that, you know, inequality is, try to imagine a society which would have worked the way John Rawls wanted it to work. That is to say that inequality is allowed on two conditions, if I simplify it. First, that 
if I gain much more than you, you should gain at least a little bit more. That is to say that it profits also those on the bottom. And second point, it shouldn't be simply inherited or what, but as much as possible based on my labor, labor achievements, whatever. I claim this is madness. I claim that, uh, that uh, if we have differences, they should be experienced as contingent. Why? Because this is the only way the differences are made tolerable because of the logic, all pervasive capitalist logic of envy and resentment. Let's say I am poor, you are rich. Let's say. Let me flip it around. <laughs> I'll be poor, you be rich. No, but I'm a good liberal, condescending liberal. Oh, Why don't you? Oh, okay. Let's pretend that you are rich from <laughs> India. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with you. You know why? Because what I really hate about political correct liberals is, did you notice how when they describe in a book like a bad guy and a good guy, like Rorty, ironist and fundamentalist. Ironist is she, fundamentalist is a she. You know, like... The good are the women, no. I think this is secret patronizing. My God, I think it's great if you can be really evil. No? Okay, another. Okay. No, what I want to say is this. Let's, let's say that we live in a society where the fact that you are rich and I am poor depends on chance, tradition, or whatever. Then I can still save my dignity because I can say to myself, oh, you see that. Sorry. You see, the total idiot is much more stupid than me, but he was lucky he is rich. So, you know, my, my narcissism survives. Now, imagine that I live in a Rawlsian just society. Then I will have to admit that you are really more intelligent, better if you are rich. It is here that violence explodes. So we should be here much more brutally open. Second thing, we should stop with this... Catholic total bullshit against, uh, you, uh, against utilitarianism in the sense of today's capitalism is egotist, greed, and so on, you know. No, capitalism, as Walter Benjamin knew, it's a form of religion. And I mean it in a literal sense, a form of metaphysics, in the sense that a true capitalist doesn't work for his or her egotistic good. A proper capitalist idea is, even if the whole world falls apart, capital has to circulate, and so on, and so on. It has nothing to do with his private gains, and so on. So, no, I claim that to be a good ecologist, it's precise. we need more egotism, in a way. Third point. Now, this will be a little bit, maybe, more uh, problematic for you. Uh, light culture. I'm for light culture, absolutely. Don't misunderstand me. No, no, no. I, was, I didn't get any special honorarium for a certain popular Dutch politician. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that uh, what I don't like in the idea of multiculturalism is this liber if you have this radical multiculturalism, it's the idea that different cultures coexist, intermingle, all we need is some neutral legal frame to allow the coexistence. No, the fact is that uh, if you look at all examples of more or less successful multiculturalism, you will al always find a light culture, but not in the sense of one is the top. In the sense of for us to coexist, we all have to accept a certain set of basic cultural norms of tolerance, blah, 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 and so on. This is absolutely crucial. What I, and, and even for dogmaticism here. In what sense? Let's take rape. I would like to live in a society where you don't have to argue why women shouldn't be raped. You know what I mean? I would like to live in a society where when someone advocates rape, he simply appears, in the best case, a bad joke, in the worst case, a complete idiot or whatever. You know, in other words, what I'm saying is let's not underestimate the necessity for, let's call it, a set of, and this cannot be politically correct commandments, it must be a set of, let's call them, unwritten rules, which regulate 
the very coexistence of different cultures, blah, blah, blah. This is where the battle is won. So again, my problem with all those from Angela Merkel to David Cameron light culture is no, they, they, it's the wrong light culture they are proposing. I'm not against light culture as such. Light culture can be a very progressive one. This is the tragedy of Hitler, the tragedy for, not for Hitler, N namely, look at Weimar Germany. Whatever we say about it critically, it obviously had a different light culture, basically it was secular Jewish light culture, with tolerance, acceptance, and Hitler radically changed the German light culture. What do I mean by this? Ah, let me even add another provocation here. Eurocentrism. Well, we have this uh, uh, far, uh, this right-wing anti-immigrant freaks who claim we defend the European legacy. I totally disagree with this uh, ridiculous, uh, ridiculous masochist liberal attitude. No, we are guilty, Europe, colonization, we kill millions, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 it's true. But nonetheless, I think it's much more effective and shocking. Once they almost beat me when I advocated this, the right wingers, it clearly hurts them to tell them, no, you got it wrong. There are good things in European tradition, feminism, equality, democracy, and so on. And our point should be you, anti-immigrant populists, you are the true threat, to, the true threat to Europe. We are, and so I mean this now. I'm slowly returning to Jan van Eyck Academy here. There is, maybe it's not, I, not, but okay. But nonetheless, I claim there are some things in European tradition which are the very core of European tradition and which are worth fighting. The idea which you find in Descartes, wonderful idea. This is the beginning of true multiculturalism for me. You remember when Descartes, at the beginning of his meditation, says, this is how I began really to think, that first other cultures appeared to me ridiculous. But then I asked myself, but what if in the eyes of other cultures, my own culture is ridiculous, and so on. This, this is why incidentally Cartesian cogito was so popular with women. Don't you know, it's not only Queen Christina of Scotland. It's many others. They said Cogito has no sex, at, at least in principle. We, we. So what I'm saying is that our, we should be much more aggressive here. Don't even concede to the enemy what he claims. What we should say is that, no, yes, we should say yes, European, he, European heritage, Judeo-Christian civilization is under threat today by you exactly by you. All that is great, you are threatening. Not, not by poor Muslims or whoever here. They are not a threat. They are, in the worst of cases, some narrow group who tries to impose, but they are not a threat. If here I am a Hegelian, a true threat comes from within. They are, imagine Europe, where how do you call this guy, Gerd Wilders, would be the Prime Minister here, where, I don't know, he died, okay, but Heider in Germany, Le Pen in France, my God. Pathetically, I claim this would no longer have been Europe in any sense. So again, we should be here much more aggressive. So again, now really to conclude with the texts, mainly, sorry, not text, with, uh, what does this mean? in all these battles, what is our duty and yours here? You know, situation has changed. That is to say, A, we no longer can play the game of traditional vanguard intellectuals who, you know, ordinary people are now protesting and we will provide the answer. I doubt. I doubt. Also, on the other hand, we should not, uh, in a pseudo Maoist way, celebrate the ordinary people. Oh, there is a wisdom in them, we intellectuals should just learn. No, you will say Mao. Eh, but Mao, as you must know, was much more wise, you know, when he did that <laughs> swimming. You know what Mao said? He said a leader should swim with the people, but he shouldn't drown <laughs> the people. He, said, ah, ah, he wasn't so... No, seriously, what I'm saying is that, let's be frank, we should not every 
false elevation of ordinary people is a fake. Recently, I reread that horrible text by Heidegger, you know, Varum in the province Blei, why should we stay in province? You know, when Heidegger was called to Berlin in 1934, and here is the scene. <coughs> Sorry, I quote Heidegger. Recently, I got an invitation to teach at the University of Berlin. On that occasion, I left Freiburg and withdrew to the cabin, Todd Nauberg, his famous hut there. I listened to what the mountains and the forests and the farmlands were saying. Uh -huh. And I went to see an old friend of mine, a 75 years old farmer. He had read about the call to Berlin in the newspapers. What would he say? Slowly, he fixed the sure gaze of his clear eyes on mine, and keeping his mouth tightly shut, he thoughtfully put his faithful hand on my shoulder. Ever so slightly, he shook his head. That meant absolutely no. No, the ordinary wisdom told. Now, first I claim one can only imagine what the old farmer was really thinking. I claim something like he knew, he tried desperately to guess what Heidegger wanted to hear from him. And probably he guessed it correctly, that Heidegger wanted to have confirmed his uh, the no. So again, today we will not learn from ordinary people, if I may put it in German, but referring to ongoing demonstrations, uh, warum sollen wir in Wall Street bleiben, or something like this, no? We, we cannot trust the people. We don't know intellectuals. So where are we? Is it a blind man leading a blind man? No, I propose a formula. I wonder if you will find acceptable this formula. I propose a simple formula which turns it around. Recently, reading a book, a very good one in English, if you don't read Russian, you should get it. You know who is uh, 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 Andrei Platonov? You had here uh, some uh, meetings on him. The great Russian writer. Uh, there is a collection of his short stories which are excellent. I more and more like Platonov from the 30s, his later texts. Uh, there is a collection called The Soul, where John Berger wrote a wonderful afterword. Where, okay, unfortunately in Negri Hart terms, he refers to multitudes of those who found themselves on the right, wrong side of the wall. And here is what he <coughs> writes. The multitudes have answers to questions which have not yet been posed and they have the capacity to outlive the walls. The questions are not yet asked, because to do so requires words and concepts which ring true, and those currently being used to name events have been rendered meaningless, democracy, freedom, productivity, and so on. With new concepts, the questions will soon be posed, for history involves precisely such a problem of questioning. Soon, question mark, within a generation. So I think he proposes a wonderful reversals that, let's call them naively, people, ordinary people. It's not that they ask us questions and we will provide the answers. No, they are the answer, but they don't know to what question they are the answer. And we intellectual should just help them and ourselves to ask the right question. What do I mean by this? Claude Levi Strauss, Strauss wrote something wonderful, I think already in 49 or 53, in his greater analysis of the kingship, that the prohibition of incest is not a question, an enigma. It is an answer to a question, but we do not know which question. And I claim it's something similar with the demands of all protesters today, Wall Street and so on. Intellectuals should not take the protesters as people who ask questions and that we intellectuals should provide answers. People demonstrating are, have answers, but we should be ready to propose, to formulate questions to which people are answers. As in psychoanalysis, where the patient knows the answer, his symptoms are answers. 
but doesn't know to walk. You know, you have a symptom, it's an answer to a deadlock. You just don't know to walk. And the analyst is not the one who is supposed to know. No, he just has to formulate a question. I find this a much more productive scheme for what goes on today. Our task is not to provide definitive answers. I don't know what. When people ask me ecology, what to do, I don't know. I only know that the great work of the criticism of ideology to be done, I know that things are happening which frighten me. For example, do you know what is geoengineering? Do you know that the state interstate agencies are already meeting to do geoengineering, which means they accept that all this bullshit about reducing emissions failed. So the idea is that mega, unimaginably large interventions into nature will be necessary. One idea, for example, is to spray into the air millions, billions of particles of iron or some other metals to block sun rays from penetrating. These are totally crazy ideas. Maybe it will be necessary. What we should do is simply to ask questions, which are the risks involved, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, again, our task, I claim, is simply this, is to ask the right questions. What do I mean by this? For example, precisely now, with all these protests, there is now a big battle about who will appropriate these protests. For example, I was attacked, they always attack me, but now again, in the New Republic, where they claim that capitalism is good, these are just the minor disruptions of capitalism, and they claim that I am the bad guy because I want to steer Wall Street into anti-capitalist waters. But I claim that this is, now let me be to conclude really serious, this is the great thing about all these protests. They answer a very clear they have a clear insight, which is what? That we have a certain political democratic system. And there is obviously, first, a certain level of economic processes, uh, uh, epitomized by 2008 crisis and so on, which simply are out of control if you limit politics to traditional party state politics. The result is that we have a certain level of uh, public rage which, for structural reasons, cannot be adequately recaptured by traditional politics. And that's to what they are the answer, this wild, wild, wild in the sense that, of course, they don't know what they want, my God, nobody knows, but basically they don't know the way, but the it's clear what is happening. All these demonstrations are, for the first time, a true implicit in them is a delegitimization of capitalism and of traditional political democracy. Here I agree with the crazy talk of Alain Badiou, but it's not an, as ominous as it may sound. He is a little bit crazy that he was able to say this. I love him. When uh, answering a question in Brazil, you know, you should look, if you have time, I don't have to Alain Badiou, you, you should look at his interviews around the world. There he says things that he would be afraid to say here. He was asked by a Brazilian journalist, what is the true threat today? He said, the name of the enemy today is not capitalism, it's not imperialism, the name of the enemy today is democracy. Okay, it sounds crazy. But what he meant was precisely this, that our sticking to democracy in this narrow sense of uh, party state representative democracy is what prevents us not only to act appropriately but even to see where the problem is. And this brings us back to the old inside by where he was right, I think, and today this protesters justify Marx that the true level where freedom or unfreedom of a society is decided is not 
Do you have multi-party system, freedom of the press? This is important, but nonetheless, the key to freedom lies in the sphere which is directly perceived as apolitical, economic relations, family relations, and so on and so on. And the problem is how to mobilize people, how to redefine democracy to, to introduce it here. Nobody has the answers now, but we are approaching a deadlock. So again, I'm not saying we should provide answers. What I'm saying is we should redefine problems, locate problems correctly, and simply open up the space of possibility. This is my first reaction, for example, to Wall Street. Of course they are, let's be brutal, but I include myself in idiots who don't know what they want. But nonetheless, it's the first formal gesture of a no, which is why in a crazy way, and I was already attacked for it, maybe you know my text, I already, uh, I, my idea was no dialogue with those in power now. Because dialogue with those in power now means we have to accept their language. We do not yet have our own language. Like when Bill Clinton said, okay, where are your proposals? No, but precisely to formulate proposals now would have meant to speak their language. We have to... This is the symbolic violence we need now. We should maintain our, as I put it, our silence. Because as I put it, everything we say can be appropriated. Our silence will remain a threat, cannot be appropriated. So again, here, you know, people thought that we live in an affluent society where only we crazy intellectuals dream about a different world and how alienated we are and so on. You know, this typical left thought 30 years ago, you know, where they try to prove it to you how alienated you are, if you are a consumerist, whatever. Now the situation is totally different. And now we will be really tested. You know, like all leftists were dreaming about revolution or radical change. But still now, as George Orwell, and my friend Nathan Dollar drew my attention to this wonderful text by George Orwell, where he said, most radical intelligence talks about revolution, but in this superstitious way, if we talk enough about it, then maybe nothing will really change, no? You know, like just to talk about it to... Uh, now, there will be a possibility of change and things will happen. And what worries me, if you allow me just this real conclusion is, for example, I got in fight with some of my friends in Greece who told me, okay, Greeks who live in London, no, Kostas Gusinas and so on, my friends, who attacked me for being unfair towards them, because at the same time they are claiming, look, the state is practically falling apart and so on. Then I asked them, okay, but what do you want, you, the protesters? And they told me, no, it's too early now, this is protest, not yet revolution, and so on and so on. But isn't this a tragic situation where all these protesters, this is a problem. You know, if you ask them what do they want, what? Do they want nationalization, the old-style communism? Do they want some kind of Keynesian welfare state? Do they want, towards which I'm most critical, this Porto Alegre bullshit of, you know, local local democracy, local self-organization. No, on the contrary, we will need social, political acts of an incredible large amount. There is so much work to be done. So, don't worry about being useless. You know what should be your motto? I believe in free thought. We live in a wonderful time when, I remember 20 years ago still, the left like to say, oh, what about, uh, oh, you live in an ivory tower, you intellectual students, ordinary people are suffering. Now Bill Gates is talking like this. Why? Because when people say people are starving and so on, the idea is, let's, you know, Bill Gates one provided the formula. He said, let's forget about all these ideological struggles, communism, socialism. Why don't we all, capitalist, state, charity, get together and do something? The implication is clear. Do it, don't think about it. No, we should have the freedom to think. You should be Marxist, you know in what sense. 
There is a wonderful line in Marx from 1870, when there was an illusion. It looked as if there will be a revolution, no? And Marx wrote a letter to Engels, very worried letter. He said, my God, you already want a revolution, but they haven't yet finished my capital. Cannot they <laughs> wait a little bit? Mar this was the good Marx. Don't be afraid, don't be blackmailed by this the bourgeois logic of making you feel guilty that you studied there. No, use the opportunity to study, start to think. It's necessary more than ever, because society is more and more falling apart around us, and we don't have answers, we don't even have the questions. I'm really sorry if I was too long, but haha, what can you do? You have to suffer. <laughs> Thank you very much.